Okay, this video is from this book, How to Improve Blood Flow. That's the subtitle. Um, and then the book is A Tale of Two Toes in a Hot Tub, the other title of it. This is chapter 10, How About Exercise? Exercise makes you wise. So that's really the question. Does exercise make you smarter? Yes, of course, it does make you smarter. Um, this first picture here is from the backyard of one of my previous houses. And this came about after I got fat. I knew I really had, I got fat in my 30s briefly, and uh, I had to really get my act together and exercise more, so I moved to this house, it was kind of rural, but that, when you go rural, the more rural you go, the more property you get for your money, and it had a tennis wall in the backyard, and we put up these uh, like flagpoles with a net so you could hit tennis balls at it, and not go in the neighbor's yard, and of course we could play basketball back there, it was great, I got tons of exercise, a lot of sunshine. I lost all the weight and it was a really good thing. Uh, okay, so this chapter 10, exercise makes you wise. So Jazz is our character in the book, Jonathan Athlete Swift, because it's kind of a takeoff on Jonathan Swift. His buddy AA is Abelard, um, Aristotle Abelard, who's advising him. So he sort of asks him, what do you think of exercise for getting better, healing his foot? And he says, yeah, Abelard, everybody should have an exercise routine. Here's a quote from Oscar Wilde, who lives in the 1800s. To win back my youth, I would do anything except take up exercise, wake up early, or be a useful member of the community. I have an arrhythmia, I can't dance. Okay. Um, the most athletic thing most people do in middle age is try to put their underwear on without touching their foot to the side. Um, here's a quote from Thomas Jefferson. He lived from 1743 to 1826. Walking is the best exercise. Habituate yourself to walk very far. Leave all the afternoon for exercise and recreation, which are as necessary as reading. I will say more necessary because health is worth more than learning. Give about two hours every day to exercise. A strong body makes the mind strong. Yep, Jefferson was a brilliant guy. Uh, here's a quote from Michel de Montaigne. You know, he lived in the 1500s. He says, to strengthen your mind, you must strengthen your muscles. Okay, there was a great Jack Leland from the 1900s, and he said, do 12 to 17 minutes every day on a treadmill for uh, cardiovascular. That's enough if you go fast. Do it vigorously and use the extra time to lift weights. Okay, he was in incredible physical shape, Lalan was. Um, the subconscious mind tends to deliver great thoughts during the morning shower. Conversation often generates great thoughts. Okay, those are little quotes about being smart. Listening to audiobooks in the car generates great thoughts. Um, yeah, so basically, if you're exercising, you're, you're just going to be smarter. You're Because you have to use so many neurons to exercise. Our brain is made for exercise. It's not really made for thinking anywhere near as much as it is made for exercise. 70% um, of your neurons are in the back, in the um, cerebellum, which is primarily short interneurons for movement. Uh, here's a quote from Tim Ferriss. He was born in 1977. He wrote, the best way to improve mental performance is to improve physical performance. Um, also, doctors should be role models for being physically fit. You learn a lot from trying to keep yourself physically fit and trying to optimize your own diet and work with your family members on their diet and exercise. And so, you know, when you're going to go before patients, you should try to be the best model you can of fitness. Okay. Okay, this paper here is brain glycogen supercompensation following exhaustive exercise. So what this did was they ran rodents, let's say, in a treadmill, and then they checked their brain glycogen pre and post, and what they found is the more intense their exercise, the more they depleted their glycogen during exercise, and the more the brain compensated by producing increased exercise. The glycogen stored in the astrocytes. Those are the supporting cells adjacent to the neurons. But still, it's rather incredible that your brain will develop increased ability to store energy in the form of glycogen for, uh, for exercise, but you also will use some of that glycogen for concentrated, prolonged thinking. And the typical thing of this is when somebody goes to college and then especially grad school, they learn that they can study for longer and longer amounts of time as they get more practice at it, and part of that is due to building up this brain glycogen. So that's something that was not previously widely known, that Glycogen is not just stored in the muscles of a person who trains for exercise, for endurance. It's also stored in the brain. 
Then another big discovery was that you can produce new neurons. That's called neurogenesis. So excessive stress will decrease neurogenesis, but healthy diet and exercise will increase neurogenesis. So uh, here's a picture of it, the things that are pro-neurogenic modulators, a healthy diet, you know, plant-based diet, and exercise. Also thinking, positive relationships add to that. You know, a good conversation is a very stimulating and, uh, and helpful to the brain. A little bit of stress can be good. You know, you're paying attention. You have to be alert with it. But excess of stress, you know, with fear and worry and all that and anxiety, that will diminish learning. Uh, excess of being sedentary will diminish learning, diminish, um, diminish ability to learn. Everything you learn comes into you and you have to categorize it and then combine it with something you already know. So that's how learning works. And new neurons being formed helps you to make new connections in your brain to become smarter. Okay, here's just a picture, you know, when I went through my fat phase. I was working way too much, doing two fellowships simultaneously, sort of in my early 30s, early to mid 30s. And I got fat for a little while, and I thought it'd be no big deal. But the fact I couldn't lose the weight for a couple of years and was getting mocked by my family really helped me. And I moved to a new house. I started exercising way more, becoming a vegetarian. And then I learned about the starch approach from McDougal, and all my weight came off. I kept it off ever since. That was many years ago now. Um, and uh, this was, yeah, that same house had a pool in the backyard. It was really a house for exercise, and the whole house was kind of like a health club. Um, that was how skinny I got. I got all the way down to 154 pounds, which was too skinny for me. I like to lift weights and got back up around 165, so I fluctuate between 165 to 170. And that's a good size for me. Okay, here was the last straw that broke the camel's back. You know, I came home from work one day and my kid tells me, he says, you're a bad father. And I'm like, well, why? What's the matter? And he said, you know, you don't help me with my basketball. He was like six man on the basketball team. And the other kid's dad was the coach. And other kid's dads were out there practicing with him and helping him. He says, all you do is work. You and mom, all you do is work. You don't spend any time with me. And sort of, I'm like, well, hey, you know, I had a basketball court out in the yard, but it was starting to get cold, and uh, the kid needed more practice to get good. So when the wife wasn't home, I had a carpenter buddy come over. We uh, put these boards across the windows to protect the windows. We moved in a basketball court in the living room because we weren't using it for anything else but storage. And the kids loved it. My kid practiced hours every day of basketball, but my wife went crazy, apeshit bananas. She's like, you're wrecking the foundation of this house. You're dropping the property value. This is a house, not a, you know, a physical fitness court. I had also put a racquetball court in one of the upstairs rooms, so I, I pissed her off a little bit too much, and we ended up having to move. I miss that house. Okay, um, other things about exercising. Um, you know, I'm 100% vegan. It sounds Spartan, but it works. Uh, of course, you know, when you contract your leg muscles, that sort of milks the venous blood up to the heart. But it does the same thing for the lymphatics. It increases lymphatic blood flow, lymphatic flow, lymph fluid, about 10 to 30 fold, and that helps your white blood cells to travel throughout the body and remove cancer cells, to remove in you know bacteria. It just makes you way um, healthier. It improves your immune function a lot, and you'll notice a lot of the healthiest people, like the ones who've recovered from metastatic cancer, are like marathon runners. Look at um, uh, you know. Ruth Heidrich, PhD lady, look at uh, Janet Murray Week Wakelin and other ones. It's uh, really helped them to exercise a lot. Um, there's an animal, a sea squirt. Oh, I don't, forgot the picture for this talk. And the sea squirt lives as a juvenile, like a tadpole. It swims around and has a brain, but when it becomes an adult, it just attaches to a rock, becomes a filter feeder, and its brain's reabsorbed. The point being is you don't need a brain if you're just going to be a filter feeder sitting around. The quote from Voltaire is, why do animals have brains but plants do not? Because animals move. Once you move, you got to make a value judgment. You have to decide where you want to go. You have to decide what you want to avoid. You have to remember how to find your way back. You have to navigate, avoid objects. So it takes intelligence. And when you move, think about you know a monkey swinging through the trees. Um, there's a, a lot involved in that. And, and so our brain's designed for that. That's why it's a lot easier to do calculus than it is to move effectively in terms of human brain resources being utilized. That's the Moravix paradox. So again, the point is when you are using your brain to move, you're using a lot of neurons. And that's also like, what's one of the healthiest things a person could do? You know, you talk about for a Parkinson's patient, for anybody, if you're dancing, because you're doing physical motion, keeping in touch with the sound, and you're socially interacting, that uses a lot of brain resources. That's a pretty healthy exercise. Um, 
Also, it exercise, of course, does so much more things. You've heard all this stuff before. It makes your physical appearance better, raises your self-esteem, you respect yourself more. Um, it causes a good type of angiogenesis. We talked about cancer and angiogenesis, the formation of new blood vessels, is bad in the, form, in the context of cancer. Those are dysmorphic blood vessels um, that are abnormal just for the cancer. But healthy increase in circulation, collateral circulation around your heart and in your brain that comes from exercise, that's really good for you. Um, increased BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic growth factor, formation of new neurons, neurogenesis, um, glycogen storage increase in your brain and the astrocytes. Oh yeah, one more thing, you get mitochondrial biogenesis. Um, mitochondrial biogenesis means you're making new mitochondria and that of course gives you more energy producing capacity. That's where your energy is formed. Those are like the coal burning electric plants of your body. Um, we talk about all these good things being improved, your muscle tone, you sweat out the toxins, your pores are little sores and you, you pump out all these toxins. It's a great way to detox yourself. I like to get to sweat from exercise. Okay. I don't like saunas cause I think in saunas you overheat your, your cojones and I don't like whirlpools. Same thing. You're overheating your cojones and you don't want to do that. That could drop your testosterone production, your sperm production. You don't want to do that. What's the purpose of the human brain? To walk down a path in a forest, a jungle, or a prairie, and to survive. Um, you know, you have to figure out where's the water, the food, the shelter. Um, the exercise makes you, puts you in a better mood. It helps you relieve your stress, you sleep better, all good things. Um, it'll decrease back pain because you'll get increased nitric oxide vasodilator going in those muscles of the spine. You get more blood going to the upper and lower end plates of the vertebra, so that will then subsequently cause more diffusion of uh, glucose to the discs of the spine as well as milking out the waste products of the disc. Neurogenesis especially occurs in the dentate gyrus and the hippocampus and the periventricular regions. Uh, hippocampus is especially important for memory. It also occurs you know, in the areas where Parkinson's is associated in the midbrain. Um, it occurs, but they're finding it in more and more areas. So it's really important for um, brain function. Okay, we talked about this. Humans are made to walk. Um, prolonged sitting, you know, you, you get less blood flow to your spine. That can cause back pain. If I sit too long, my back starts hurting. Uh, all you can do is just get up, walk, you know, have a standing desk if you can, a treadmill desk. Get up and walk to the bathroom. Do some stairs even better. Um, you know, if, I, I actually will go backwards downstairs just because it's easier on my knees. But stairs are great exercise, going upstairs especially. Um, use the bathroom far away. Runners are notoriously smart. In my high school, they were the smartest kids in the whole high school by far. And Ruth Hydra said she's never seen a runner uh, become demented in her experience. Um, at Naperville Central High School in Illinois, they had the students run uh, before math class and they found their test scores improved dramatically. And that was repeated successfully at other high school. Um, high intensity interval training is the most efficient way to train quickly for mitochondrial biogenesis. That's kind of why I do high repetition squats and go as fast as I can because I'm trying to achieve mitochondrial biogenesis. The fastest way to get stronger if you want to build physical strength is do squats because you have to use your whole body. It's just like standing up from a chair. That's a squat um, because that enables you to hold the most weight on your body. You can do deadlifts, but deadlifts are more prone to injury. Same thing with bench press, more prone to injury. Squatting is such a natural movement to stand up from a chair that... You're unlikely to get injured from it. If you have a shoulder problem, you can use the safety squat bar. Hold your hands in tight. I made a video about that recently, uh, doing squats with the safety squat bar. Okay, a couple things for exercise. How do you increase the intensity? Because you want to keep a training book of what you're doing and then keep on making it a little more intense. Increase the repetitions, the speed, the weight, the number of sets, the frequency of workouts. Have good motivational music. If you can, have a partner to train with. All these things ramp up your intensity. You get better. Um, you know, Tom Platts is one of the persons I learned high rep squats from and some other people. Um, let's see. A young guy will think it's crazy to do such high reps, but I'm doing it for physical endurance, not just for uh, strength. That's why uh, I do such high reps. I'll do as many, anywhere typically routinely from 60 to 120 reps. Um, a lot of these young guys, they eat a terrible diet. Um, but And also, by the way, what type of strength am I working for? I want to be like you know the farm boy that can sit out there throwing 50-pound bales of hay all day. Good physical uh, strength that can do useful work. And I'm quite certain that if my house was on fire, I would be able to carry all of my children to safety. The wife might be a little too heavy. Um, I think high reps is the way to go because it develops all the energy systems of the muscle, anaerobic, anaerobic 
um, types and they lead to increased glycogen storage. Um, I also, I only use free weights. I don't really like those machines because I think the machine's tricky into thinking you're stronger than you are and you have a tendency to put too much weight on there and get injured. Versus if you use free weights, you have to have all the stabilizer muscles active. You have to maintain your balance. Uh, it's more athletic. Um, if you're really worried about it, you can squat within a squat rack for, rack for extra safety where if you drop the weight, it would be someplace to catch it. Um, most important thing for weightlifters, don't get injured because when you're injured, that can set you back for months or, or longer. Um, I recommend don't ever take bodybuilding supplements. The proteins are harmful to you. They can be harmful to your kidneys and accelerate your aging towards the hay flick limit. Uh, I've seen a lot of young guys, they're, you know, they're kind of stupid. They keep taking all these protein supplements and a significant number of them bump themselves into kidney failure. It could be reversible early on, but later on, nope. And there's often contamination with heavy metals. Protein supplements are, in my opinion, a bad idea. Um, average pro football player tends to die at 54 years of age. They've all had a lot of head trauma. Potentially, you know, usually they're eating a high-fat diet, a lot of meat. Uh, average male vegan in the Seventh-day Adventist lives to 87. A pro football player, average one, dies around 54 years of age. That's 33 years of difference. Yeah, football's a lot of fun. There's a lot of glory, but still, you know. And a lot of these guys, they would live much longer if they, you know, took on a low-fat vegan diet once they got done, you know, playing in the NFL. Um, they also have a lot of aging, from, you know, like I said, from their nephrotoxic protein supplements they're probably taking, their atherogenic diet, their traumatic brain injury. A lot of them are on anabolic steroids. And then, like we said, the traumatic brain injury patients, uh, they're telling them to eat the Mediterranean diet, which is totally stupid. That accelerates atherosclerosis. Um, all right, yeah, I've written other stuff on muscle, more extent. Oh, Mark Ripto, you got a squat or you're a wussy. All right. Again, squats are the best exercise to quickly build strength. All right, start with air squats and then work up to light weights. You can just hold a dumbbell or a kettlebell and, you know, initially and squat with that and, and gradually keep building yourself up. It'll take a while. It can take weeks before you're ready to put a barbell on your back and really squat. Um, Pre-workout meal, you know, it depends. I don't need a pre-workout meal if I'm doing an easy workout, but if I'm going to go for a personal best, what I like to do is drink 32 ounces of beet juice followed by 16 ounces of water, rinse my teeth off of water. I don't have to floss. It's also good to eat a bigger meal earlier in the day, you know, get some fruits and some grains on board and some greens so your, your whole body's hydrated and with all the optimal nutrients, take a nap. That's how you're strongest for personal best workouts. If you don't got any beet juice and you really want to eat a pre-workout meal, like a beet juice, you should precede your workout about an hour and a half, two hours before. Uh, if you're eating fruits, I'd probably be more like around two and a half to three hours before. Well, two to three hours, somewhere in there. If I was eating fruit, I probably wouldn't be that intense that day. Um, you got to clean your teeth up afterwards. With that. By that, I mean floss or at least use those interdental brushes. Uh, being sedentary is really, you know, habitually is really bad for you because your blood and water are not the same thing. When blood sits, it starts to clot. It starts to aggregate. That's what I meant by blood is non-Newtonian. Water is Newtonian. Blood is thixotropic, meaning that when it's stationary, it starts to aggregate and that's why like if you're driving in the car for a couple hours and you get out you're all stiff it takes a while before your your red blood cells sort of detach from each other and start flowing smoothly and delivering oxygen as fast as you want it to um if you're too stationary that's why you can get clots in all kinds of spots in your body it's not good to be too stationary for too long What happens when you get out of a car after a long commute? Your feet hurt, et cetera. Like I said, uh, we talked about that. Um, it lowers the risk of cancer. We talked about that. So just do all kinds of little things. Like if I get a phone call, I'll stand up. Um, I'm always looking for a reason to keep moving. You know, Get a standing desk. Uh, when you take little breaks from studying or from working, whatever you do, do some air squats, walk to the far bathroom, go up some stairs. Just keep moving. Movement is life. And young people, you go to a family holiday party, Young people are running around doing all kinds of stuff. That's a sign of vigorous life. So try to keep moving as best you can. Um, you can walk around while you eat. If you're by yourself, you can walk around with your bowl and, and eat. You know, I have a tendency too much to watch YouTube videos while I'm eating, but walking around is a good thing to do when you're by yourself eating. I think our ancestors did that all the time. Uh, so anyways, hope that's helpful.